Welcome back, honors. All right. Welcome back to your first weekend flip in a minute. All right. So due to the fact that we got to go. All right. So y'all are going to have a bunch of flips this week and we're going to keep moving because we lost a couple of days to, to open house and due to Monday in service day. Right. But we got to go. Got to go. Got to keep moving. All right. So we left off talking about how the barbarians were going to organize, right? We talked about like all the Middle Age time periods. We talked about uh, the establishment of the Middle Ages. We talked about the fall of Rome. We talked about the Byzantine. We talked about all this other crazy stuff. All right. So getting into it, though. Yeah. Anyway, so let's go ahead and keep pushing. We got to kind of figure out in the long run, how is it possible that Rome falls in Western Europe and leaves a chaotic mess, right? Like, we've got the Goths, the Franks, the Visigoths, the Gauls, the Huns, the Saxons, the Angles, the Jutes is one that was actually one at one point, the Danes, the Magyars, the... Anybody else? The Vandals, right? Like, we got all these people... Oh, and that's a Josie. She's also a barbarian. Unlike Mr. Rubio. Yeah, see? She's just disordered back there. Now, anyway, how are we going to get... From this, which is the Roman Empire at 117 AD, look how huge it is, to this, which is the modern map of Europe with all of these different countries. How did we get from this to this? All right, so, and the big story of how we get from that to that, a lot of that has to do with the consolidation of territory under a few different men during the Middle Ages, right? So, now... Some of y'all are immediately like, well, I liked it when we talked about Theodora, because she was a dope woman who pretty much led the Byzantine on her own. This is more along the lines of, these were just all happened to be men, all right? So now, the first one to step up is going to be the leader of the Franks, all right? So really quick, as a little title, little, little, little separator, we're still in the early Middle Ages, by the way. Let's put the Franks, all right? So the Franks happen to be, unfortunately, the people that kind of reorganize all of Europe following the fall of Rome. The Franks are a very important group of people, but they're just really annoying because they speak the French language, and I don't like giving them that much credit, all right? So anyway, but the big leader that they have up front is this guy. Clovis, right, who rules from about, who's alive from about 466 to 511, okay? Now, some of y'all are immediately saying, you're like, wait a minute, 466? He was like 10 when Rome fell? He was. Actually, Clovis was a subject of the Roman Empire for quite some time in the early forms of his life. And then when Rome falls and everyone's kind of running around trying to reorganize everything, Clovis is the first one to reorganize a specific group of barbarians, right? Clovis reorganizes the Franks, and he establishes the very first Frankish kingdom. He then also creates the, his own dynasty, his own family-organized dynasty known as the Merovingians, all right? So as you can see down here, the Merovingian dynasty. Now, he also may have been a Roman military leader. We don't really necessarily know, but the big thing about him is he's going to conquer a lot of these small competing tribes in, and regional Roman political leaders. He's going to go out there to these villas, and he's going to take a lot of this land back. So more than likely, he could have been a Roman military leader with like two leftover legions from when Rome fell. He takes those two legions and he goes out and he starts picking up all these different little areas, right? And he starts conquering a bunch of this, these little barbarian tribes, right? Now, in the long run, though, he then eventually converts to Christianity to try and find a force to universally rule over his people. Because at the time, a lot of, like, there were pagans that were still some of the barbarian groups were pagans, which means they are polytheistic, they, they worship multiple gods. Some of them were Aryan Christians, which they believed uh, that God, or that Christ was not actually a, was a man, not necessarily a divine being, like he was up there, but he wasn't quite, like, God-like. He's much more like prophet of Islam, kind of Muhammad, like, kind of, like, orchestrated idea. Um, but he wanted to universally rule over all his people with one faith. So he has himself converted to Catholic Christianity, right? Now, ultimately ironic, speaking of strong women, the person who convinced him to do this was actually his wife, all right? So his wife convinced him to do it and was like, look, you should convert to Catholic Christianity to try and have the backing of Rome, and then also you'll be able to easily rule over a lot more people. And then he was like, I don't want to do that. You know, like, I like this whole pagan thing I got going on. And then she says, well, Nimrod, like, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to go baptize your eldest son so when you die, he'll, like, become a leader and he'll have this ruling power that I suggest. 
yeah, there was an infection in the baptismal water, and he died. <laughs> like, so the, the son she had baptized in secret died. And then Clovis is like, what the heck? This I definitely don't want to be Christian now. And then she says, whoa, 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 that was just a test. And then takes the other son and has that one baptized, and then he almost dies from, like, the same infection. But eventually Clovis decides to convert when he realizes that ruling authority will also come along with it. And as you can see... Every time he's painted, they adopted this bad boy, the fleur-de-lis, right? So the fleur-de-lis that, I don't know if y'all know this, becomes the ruling symbol of the French household and the connection of Catholic Christianity because it's supposed to symbolize the Holy Trinity, right? So now, he's considered the founder and the father of France, and the biggest thing about him is he creates the first empire, country, territory, thing, all right, so since the fall of Rome. It's not like Rome. It doesn't have defined boundaries. It doesn't have a defined political system. It doesn't have defined culture or movement or poetry or music or architecture. But it's a thing, all right? So we've got to give him credit from that because we're trying to get from that huge empire to getting to what Europe looks like now. So he establishes the Frankish kingdom, which the bulk of it happens to exist in modern day France, right? So the French like to feel like they're the first like modern Western Europeans since the fall of Rome. And a lot of them are like, yay Clovis or yay Charlemagne. Actually, a lot of them don't like Charlemagne that much. But uh, anyway, so the Frankish kingdom looked like this around 768, right? So following the death of Clovis. So Clovis is going to have multiple sons, but what's going to end up happening, which is really, really weird, a lot of his sons don't actually do a good job leading. Because there's a different position. Jot this down before you write all this stuff down, right? Mayor of the castle, all right? So, so you would have a king, and then you would have this person known as the mayor of the castle, right? So, And the mayor of the castle actually had more leading authority than the kings, which after the death of Clovis, the kings became much more of a, like a figurehead, I guess you could say, um, in a weird... Like, it's very odd, all right? So, the, like, they just kind of start, like, it's very difficult to explain, all right? So, but you basically had this person known as your mayor, right? The mayor actually had more power and directly influenced the king. The king was much more of a symbol of this united territory, right? And the most famous mayor out of all of them was this guy known as Charles Martel, right? So, Charles Martel, who was not officially a king himself, uh, believed that, you know what? Um, I'm going to still rule with authority, even though I don't even really have to ask for any kind of permission or do any of that stuff whatsoever. So the biggest thing about, uh, mayor, oh, it's crap. It's mayor of the palace, mayor of the palace. Sorry about that. Not mayor of the castle, mayor of the palace. All right. So mayor of the palace, Charles Martel decides that he is going to try and put his foot forward and try to create a bigger and nicer area. Right. And he does this by trying to figure out two things. One, he's like, I got to go out here and I got to conquest more area to the our, our east, right? I got to take over some of these Germanic people. But then I also have a threat, all right? So this right here is what Charles Martel is looking at. Charles Martel, the mayor of the palace, right? The, like leader um, after like the death of Clovis much later on. Look at this ugly thing, all right? So like he decides to go out there and take over some of these Germanics. And then you have this. What's this green down here? That green happens to be the Umayyad Caliphate, all right? The Muslim territory, remember we talked about this already, during their Eastern Golden Age, had grown to a massive size. And they had actually gone from Saudi Arabia all the way over North Africa and then all the way into Spain, right? So, like, as we talked about right there, this was the Umayyad Caliphate. They were the biggest and wealthiest empire that the world had like seen up to this point, right? So some like historians argue that they actually had more territory than ancient Rome, okay? So the thing about, and there we go, uh, the thing about that impact is this is an actual church, mosque, uh, church or converted mosque in Andalus Andalusia, Spain, in the south of Spain. Look at the Muslim architecture that actually is all over it and the wealth of design and intelligence that's all over it. Well, Charles Martel decides to stop all of that and he earns himself the nickname The Hammer. Charles The Hammer Martel. Because he literally beats the Muslims down back into Spain. So you see that they're kind of threatening that Frankish kingdom that was set up by Clovis. Charles Martel decides, like, nope, and, like, he actually goes to the Battle of Tours, and he actually pushes them down and kind of creates a barrier between Spain and the Franks, giving them the time to grow and flower and learn to dominate parts of Europe. 
Well, then comes along his grandson. So Charles Martel never becomes king, but his grandson does, right? So he is going to be a powerful leader, a strong Christian. And in Latin, his name is Carolinus Magnus, which means Charles the Great, right? Now, created the Carolingian Empire. So we had the Merovingians under Clovis, and eventually his line dies out, right? So, and then Charles the Great inducts his son Pepin the Short into being the first king of the Carolingian dynasty. Carolingian being the, like, the empire of Charles, right? So Charles Martel. So Charlemagne shows up, and he is his second eldest son, right? Or no, his grandson, excuse me. He's Charles Martel's grandson. And he creates this thing known as the Carolingian Empire after the death of his other brother, and he becomes the king of this entire Frankish kingdom. Now, his big thing is, I'm going to take the Merovingian successes, and I'm going to use this to grow my family's rule, right? So Charlemagne decides to set out and start conquesting as much as he possibly can, right? And he does this in two ways. One is religious, and one is for the military strength, right? So Charlemagne, also known as Charlotte, Charles the Great, even earns the support of the Pope at the time, right? Pope Leo III, like, actually crowns him the first Holy Roman Emperor, like, after he saved him, right? So Charles the Great knew that there was this big conflict between the Pope and these other people that lived in Italy called the Lombards. And so he actually goes in there and destroys the Lombards and saves the Pope himself and even carves out an entire country for, of Italy for the Pope. It's called the Papal States. Jot that down. The Papal States. He carves out the like a chunk of Italy and names it the Papal States and allows the Pope to rule over it completely. And so in return to being kind, Pope Leo crowns him an official king and the ruler of the Romans, which makes the Byzantinians really, really angry because they feel like they're the Romans anyway, right? So Charlemagne's also known as the father of Europe because he's going to start uniting a lot of these barbarian tribes in Western Europe, spreading Christianity, and he's going to bring about a large amount of stability, right? So he also starts this thing known as the Carolingian Renaissance. When he becomes king of the Frankish kingdom at the time, right, or like going into the Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne forces all nobles and aristocrats to learn how to read and write and study and understand the growth of intelligence because he's like, you can't communicate with me if you all can't read, write, and do understand this easily. And so they actually even come up with a new system of writing called Carolingian Minuscule. They actually introduce capital letters. Like, so nobody was writing in uppercase and lowercase letters. They were all writing in just like this random script so you couldn't understand what anyone was writing person to person. So the Carolingian Renaissance is actually the thing that brought about standardized education. We're all going to learn the same alphabet. We're all going to learn how to use the same sentence structure, and we're all going to learn how to actually do this together, right? So Charlemagne even brings back intelligence. And this is his conquest. Look at all the area that he actually adds to the Frankish kingdom. He's a massive success. And also there's some other little fun facts about him. He had two sons. One of them was named Pepin, but he had a hunchback and he didn't want him to eventually be king. So he then named his other son Pepin. Pepin, and then they were like, wait, you had another Pepin, and he was like, N -n -n no, I didn't. All right, so, and then he banishes that hunchback Pepin to go live with a bunch of priests, so he can never be king, right? So, he also had a bunch of daughters, and he never allowed any of his daughters to get married, because he didn't want anyone to challenge his rule for authority, even though he allowed them to live with men and actually have children in kind of like a domestic partnership kind of thing, but he never wanted them to get married, because he didn't want anybody to challenge the Carolingian family for rule. But after Charlemagne dies, he ends up giving up a lot of his territory to his three sons, right? He has three surviving sons, and they end up fighting over all of the territory, and they actually split it all up in 842 at this thing called the Treaty of Verdun, right? So go ahead and write down the Treaty of Verdun, and the Treaty of Verdun kind of created the first three distinct kingdoms or countries in Europe. It's another way that we're going to get to this instead of looking like a giant empire, right? So at the Treaty of Verdun, they separated into three different countries, one of them now being modern day France, the other one in the middle becoming the Holy Roman Empire, and this one also being sucked up and becoming like the Holy Roman Empire, which is like a Germanic state. So Germany, basically, right? So the Treaty of Verdun basically introduces the concepts of France and Germany. So Charlemagne's a very, very intense figure, and you need to know exactly who he is. But the second they do all these things, all of a sudden these people known as the Vikings show up, right? So the Vikings, also known as the Danes, all right? So also known as Norsemen. So the Vikings lived in the northern territories, right? Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, these different areas, okay? 
And the Vikings are a warrior culture from that region known as Scandinavia. They started leading raids all over Europe. And their raids are going to be one of the massive, massive government-shifting forces throughout all of the Middle Ages. Because they're going to lead to the establishment of feudalism, right? So if you look at the two empires that we've talked about already, you got the Byzantine... Yeah, there we go. You got the Byzantine down here towards Greece, Turkey, and the Balkans, right? They're an empire system where they have one central figure and a centralized government, much like Egypt did back in the day. The raids of the Vikings are going to lead to a more Mesopotamian-style government where it's like individual kind of city-states all trying to function together. Except instead of calling them city-states, they call it a feudal system. And the feudal system looks like this. So what I need you to do is I need you to go ahead and draw this out. All right, so hit pause. Draw this in your notes. All right, let's go. All right, so anyway, now, so the feudal system, because of the Viking raids that they were actually led, uh, they end up, like, becoming the only way that Europe, in its chaotic state that it's in post-fall of Rome, can organize itself and kind of rule efficiently, right? And in the feudal system, at the very, very top, you have your king, right? He exists outside of everything. He's kind of just the central figure in your biggest territory, and everything goes and flows through him. Ironically enough, he's just kind of the biggest out of everybody. He really should be a part of this triangle, but for the sake of understanding, this makes a lot more sense, right? So, the king is at the very, very tip top. And then you have lords or nobles. Lords or nobles are families that have officially been recognized by the king to rule over large plots of land, okay? And go ahead, speaking of those plots of land, jot this down. F-I-E-F. -E Put it, like, over here somewhere. A fief is a large plot of land ruled over by a lord or a noble, right? So where did those things come from? Those fiefs actually, we believe, are old Roman villas, right? Remember the villas we talked about? Like Shannon, when she was a big patrician and she had a villa, this huge plantation with all this land and all this other stuff, right? So the villas were a very, very important governmental construct. But when Rome falls, the villas just end up being these giant real estate led by old Roman patricians. So instead, these patricians turned into lords and nobles and turned those lands into fiefs, right? So it turned them into basically this new amalgamated feudal system. So the lords and nobles are going to rule over these lands efficiently, right? They are going to actually be using their land to farm, make as much as they possibly can, and lead to a government style that's just kind of very all over the place. But... Then, let's say hypothetically, your lord or your noble has four sons, right? Well, only one of those sons is going to inherit the land, inherit that fief, and take over this whole thing. So where do the other three go? They become what's known as vassals, right? Vassals or knights, right? Vassals or knights are, were there to try and provide some type of like protection, right? Vassals or knights were people hired by lords and nobles, usually from other families, to try and like keep them safe from barbarian invasions, right? So, and then your last one at the very, very bottom are known as serfs. Serfs aren't slaves. I don't know how many times I have to say this throughout the years. Serfs are people bound to the land by a contract. They're peasants, all right? They're very, very poor, and they need some place to go. Because if they're living out in the country, out in the outskirts, all alone in their own little individual homes, they're very susceptible to being attacked by Vikings or Hoths or Huns or Gauls or Magyars. So instead, they seek for security that's protected by vassals and owned by the Lord on these different plots of land. So the serfs are bound to the land by a contract, much like a lease agreement. That's where we get the name landlord from, right? So the lord of the land writes up a contract saying you will work here for a certain amount of time until we decide to either release you and or you decide, decide to sign another contract and stay longer. So here's the thing, though. If the serfs don't have any money, how do they actually give something to the lords? This arrow right here, what are they giving that's giving them like the right to stay there? It's their labor, right? They pay the lords in a tax form of their labor. They farm, they do what needs to be done, they work the fief, right? The vassals provide military service to the lords and the kings, right? Because if the king ever wants to wage war, he lets his nobles, hey, send your vassals, right? They assemble an army, and then they go out to fight a war. And then the lords 
pay their taxes. And that's how this entire system works. So the Byzantine had its empire system. The Europe had its feudal system, right? F-E-U-D-A-L. It's feudal system. And that's what this whole chart is, all right? Whew. I know that was a lot, but it's all good. I hope you all have a great weekend. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Or wait, not tomorrow. Oh, wait, it's Saturday. Go Tigers. I'll see you all then. Have a great weekend.